The next speaker is Dr. Luke Cantley, who is the director of the Cancer Center at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and is going to tell us all he knows about the PI3 kinase pathway. Okay, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to continue with some of the same themes that uh, Bill was pushing. Uh, I think Bill and I are, uh, uh, I think, on the same page in, in most of these ideas about targeted therapies. So the learning objective is to describe methods for selection of patients for clinical trials with targeted therapies. Next slide. Uh, so the PI, I'm not going to go into great detail on the PI3 kinase pathway. It's really a network of signaling. The importance of this network is it evolved to control cell growth. Uh, and in fact, the PI3 kinase pathway primarily evolved to, to, to regulate cell growth by controlling glucose uptake and converting glucose into an anabolic molecule to make proteins, DNA, lipid, uh, and, uh, and, and drive the cells into growth. Uh, and so this uh, pathway is actually quite ancient. It's in uh, multicellular organisms, but components of the network, particularly mTOR in the bottom part of this pathway that you see here, um, are conserved all the way back to yeast. So the bottom of half of the pathway, which senses the energy status of the cell and whether or not there's sufficient nitrogen by amino acids, uh, is, is a controlling mechanism for growth in yeast. And what's happened in higher eukaryotes is it superimposed on this basic machinery for deciding whether to grow or not is the input of growth factors. Uh, and so growth factor receptors, by activating PI3 kinase in RAS, end up turning on a redundant mechanism by which you ultimately turn on mTOR. So a cell can have plenty of amino acids, plenty of energy, but it still won't decide to grow unless this network is turned on. And normally it's designed during evolution or wound repair to be turned on by a growth factor. But if you have mutations such that the downstream signaling of the growth factor receptor, either the receptor itself is continuously on through mutations or some of its targets through mutations are continuously on, the cell then receives a signal to continue to grow. Now what's remarkable about this is that at least 80% of all cancers have this as a mechanism. In fact, maybe 100% do, but we can say, I think, with some certainty, at least 80% do, because by the time you add up mutations in RAS, RAF, PI3 kinase, AKT, loss of P10, loss of NF1, tuberin, and PP4B, or activated receptor tyrosine kinases, you find at least 80% of the tumors you look at have at least one, if not more, of these events going on. So I, I like to think of this, I'm, I'm now in a systems biology department, and systems biologists don't really like uh, this biochemistry and lipids and things like that. So they like to think about computers, and so to them I just call this a computer AND gate. And the inputs are sufficient ATP, all the essential amino acids, and a growth factor, and if all three of those are present, a cell will decide to grow. And there's a logical network, which is what you saw in the previous slide, by which that occurs. So a year or so ago, we put together a dream team, quote unquote. Uh, <laughs> some of the members of the team are laughing. <laughs> uh, to target the PI3 kinase pathway in women's cancers. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll provide some detail of all the people involved in the dream team. But it really is a fantastic group of people that we've gotten together to attack this, from clinicians on the front lines to pathologists to uh, bioinformatics people as well as people working with mouse models and working on the pathways. Uh, and one of the first things we did in putting this team together uh, was to assess across all the institutions involved, and there are seven institutions, uh, what the mutational events are in women's cancers. So we looked at the subtypes of breast cancer, endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, and just pulled all the unpublished data for MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Columbia, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Dana-Farber, uh, B.I. Deaconess, uh, and we ask, you know, of all the tumors that we've looked at, how frequently do we see, do we see mutations in PI3 kinase and P10, in fact, all the components of that network that you saw on the previous slide. And what we found is that PI3 kinase in particular is extremely frequently mutated in breast cancer. Roughly 27 percent of all breast cancer patients have mutations in the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase. If you look at the subtypes, the ER positive, it's roughly a third of ER positive breast cancers have PIK3CA mutations. Uh, about 25% of the uh, HER2 positive cancers have this. If you look at triple negatives, they rarely have PIK3CA mutations. 
but they have loss of the tumor suppressor P10, which is a negative regulator of the pathway, and they also have loss of another gene that we discovered as a tumor suppressor just a couple of years ago called INPP4B, which like P10, degrades lipid products of PI3 kinase and thereby turns off the pathway. So 60% of, of triple negative cancers have uh, INPP4B deletions. So this uh, uh, allowed us then to begin to uh, design clinical trials because we could estimate the frequency at which we would have patients that would have at least one aberration uh, in this network uh, as we enrolled uh, patients in various uh, neoadjuvant and uh, metastatic uh, disease with PI3 kinase inhibitors. We, in, endometrial cancer, uh, which is, of course, uh, far less frequent in breast cancer, but in the inoperable stage is, is a lethal disease. There's currently no successful treatment for inoperable endometrial cancer, and therefore there's a great demand for drugs in this area, and one can think about doing single-agent trials because conventional therapy doesn't really work. Everyone dies within about a year if it's inoperable. So we've interrogated this in great detail, and it's really quite remarkable how frequently you see mutations in this, this network in, this, in these patients. So this is just looking at mutations, not looking at uh, amplifications or protein level. But if you look at loss of P10 at the protein level or deletions plus mutations, it accounts for about 80% of endometrial cancer. But just mutations alone accounts for about uh, 40%, 35, uh, you know, roughly 40%. But what's remarkable is that you, at the same time that you see loss of P10, you also see activating mutations in the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase and also mutations in the regulatory subunit, which have not really been shown, shown up in cancer in general until uh, discovered in glioblastomas at about a 10% frequency. As we're now beginning to look more deeply into these other cancers we're finding, the regulatory subunit is also very frequently mutated. And you also see RAS mutated. And in fact, in some tumors, you see a RAS mutation, a PIK3CA mutation, a P10 mutation, all in the same patient. And even in cell lines, we can see all of those occurring in a single cell line. So some of this may be diversity within the tumor, but we even know that in a single cell, all these things can happen simultaneously. So um, and I should say that early trials with mTOR inhibitors are already looking interesting in this disease. So we have a lot of uh, optimism that targeting this network is going to be useful. Now, as Bill pointed out, there's a lot of interest in targeting the nodes of this network. Uh, and there are currently, uh, I think at last count, about uh, 15 PI3 kinase catalytic site inhibitors in uh, phase one and a few beginning to enter phase two clinical trials. Some of these hit both the catalytic subunit of PI3 kinase and the catalytic su subunit of mTOR. Uh, such as BEZ-235, which Bill talked about in the previous talk, while others are, are targeted only to PI3 kinase, PKM-120, another Novartis drug, and I'll be talking about both of these drugs. I left out all the agents that are targeting the, the MAP kinase path part of this network, uh, uh, but as I think most of you know, RAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors are, certain, are showing excitement in BRAF melanoma. Uh, so with uh, this number of agents in phase one, phase two trials, our dream team actually has a problem because, you know, which ones do we work with? Uh, we can only do so many trials. How do we decide which agents to try? If we want to do combination therapies, you're really in trouble because if you count all the possible drugs here and just start thinking of random combinations of all of them, there aren't enough patients on earth to do the clinical trials necessary to test all those possible combinations. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, we have to figure out preclinical mechanisms to make those decisions. And we already have, we know the problems with preclinical models that exist. This is a slide that I got from Jose Vesalga, who's a member of our dream team. Uh, he joined the te dream team uh, from Barcelona, has now migrated here. As you all know, you'll hear from him uh, later. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're sort of adopting Mass General into our, <laughs> into our uh, dream team as he makes his migration. Uh, and so this is uh, data on BKM120, the PI3 kinase only inhibitor. Does not, it hits all the class 1A PI3 kinases, but does not hit mTOR. Uh, and, and you know, there was one really remarkable response uh, with this drug. This was in a triple negative setting. In a number that are close to being uh, clinical responses, uh, the majority of patients in phase 1 have uh, progressed on the drug. 
Uh, but these are still at stages of determining dose-limiting toxicities. Uh, but it's beginning to tell us that, yes, there are going to be responses in the clinic, uh, as, and uh, we should uh, need to figure out what the difference is between this group and this group. So how do we do that? Obviously, we need to know what the mutations are in the patients. So the dream team strategy, then, is to, um, to do a broader array of trials designed to complement and expand upon laboratory investigation. Initial trials designed to focus on proof of concept and not intended to be practice changing. Some of our trials will have arms that require mutations in PI3 kinase, PIK3CA, or P10 to be in one arm, uh, and agents with, uh, patients without those mutations in a second arm. But a lot of the trials will be more retrospective analysis where we'll get uh, surgical material, in fact, surgical material and, and or biopsies required for all the trials that we do, and we'll deeply interrogate all the mutations in this network that I told you about. But in cases where we can get sufficient DNA, we will do broad interrogations of all oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. As technologies get better and better for doing these mutational analysis and amplifications and deletions, uh, we think we can get more and more information, even from core biopsies uh, where you have a limited amount of DNA. There are technologies that, that can get uh, a dramatic amount of information. So the types of cancers we'll, we have trials in are HER2-positive, triple-negative, and ER-positive breast cancers, uh, endometrial, and ovarian cancers. And as I say, we require surgical material or biopsies on every single patient. Ideally, we want biopsies at the time the patient goes on the drug. Surgical material tells us a history of what was going on perhaps several years ago, but does not necessarily affect the disease today. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have a, a team of people on, uh, on, in, in our uh, dream team that are experts in designing uh, genetically engineered mouse models for cancer. Uh, and we're also doing uh, uh, transplants of human cancers directly into the mouse is another way to interrogate, and particularly in ovarian cancer, this seems to be a good strategy to take. Uh, but the, the goal is to make the mouse models as accurately as possible, replicate what we know is going on in the human disease. So from the survey of all the mutations that occur and what frequencies in the various subtypes of breast cancer and endometrial cancer, we have now engineered mice, and fortunately a lot of this work was already done before we even put the team together, where we have activated PI3 kinase expressed in breast epithelial tissue, and these can be then crossed into other models, uh, P10 loss, HER2 uh, amplification, et cetera, et cetera, to mimic what we know is happening in human disease. And, and what we're finding is the closer you get to engineering in the mutations that you actually see frequently in human disease, the better the mouse model actually reflects the drug sensitivity that you see in the clinic. So I think problems with mouse models in the past have generally been that we're still not engineering necessarily into the right cell or the right mutation uh, to mimic what we actually, what's actually happening in the human disease. So I'll talk about some breast models that are, mo that are being developed in our, uh, in our dream team. Uh, Gene Zhao at the Dana-Farber uh, has uh, engineered uh, mice to express the PIK3CA mutant form of PI3 kinase in the breast. So this is using an MMTV uh, RTTA, uh, which gives you a doxy-inducible tumor. So only when you put the mouse on doxycycline is this human, this is actually the human gene is being, is, is expressed in the mouse. Uh, so only expressed in the breast tissue and only when you add doxycycline. And what happens is the mice uh, develop tumors. <laughs> This is engineered also to have a luciferase reporter, so you can actually see the mice glowing in the dark uh, where the tumors come up. Uh, so this makes it easier to detect them and follow their changes in size. So what happens is every single mouse that goes on doxycycline that has this transgene develops a cancer, but it takes a long time for the cancer to develop. So you can see about 200 days on doxycycline uh, is the median time for the emergence of these tumors. Once they emerge, they ultimately become lethal, so they kill the mice. But for any event that requires that long to occur, clearly there have to be secondary events that are happening in the mice in order to allow the tumor to occur. pic 3 ca alone is not enough to drive a breast tumor. We're quite confident of that. These tumors uh, very frequently metastasize uh, to the lung. And uh, so in, in this way, mimic uh, what we see going on. These, uh, are also quite variable from mouse to mouse in the pathology of the tumor. 
Uh, so the secondary events that occur are creating divergence in, in the type of tumor that emerges. A lot of these look like ER positive cancers, but not all of them. So what gene is doing uh, to accelerate this and, and to mimic the other events that we know are happening in the human disease is to cross these into uh, MIC-driven uh, uh, amplification models, uh, HER2 amplification models, and loss of P10 models crossed into the PIC3CA, because these are events that we see very frequently in the human disease. And she has some data on this. If you cross into the HER2 amplified, and that's 25% of HER2 positive cancers have this combination of events. Now, instead of taking 200 days for the tumor to emerge, it takes only 40 days. So I think this is why those two events happen simultaneously. They clearly cooperate to drive the tumor. Now, this gives us an opportunity now to try uh, antibodies against HER2 in combination with PI3 kinase inhibitors to see because those are one of the trials that we're going to do. We, we can find out very quickly in the mice whether that's likely to work and what the secondary events are uh, that are likely to lead to resistance. Now, the question is, for these rather simple mouse models where the PIK3CA is clearly driving the cancer, are the mice actually addicted to that mutation? Clearly, that's the initiating event. In the case of the human disease, we never know when the PIK3CA mutation occurred. Was it early in the disease? Was it late in the disease? Is the cancer going to be, a, is the patient going to be addicted or the tumor be addicted to that event or not? In the mouse, we know it's the initiating event. But is it still, even though it's initiating, it, is the mouse still addicted to that initiating event? So Gene is beginning to address that. And I should say that in the, uh, the initial mouse models that Jeff Engelman did, and he, he may talk about these uh, later today, uh, in the lung, where he, he introduced exactly the same mutation, a doxy inducible pic 3 ca in the lung, every mouse that got a tumor was addicted to that tumor. So if you took them off doxy, those, the tumors went away, or you gave them PI3 kinase inhibitors, the tumors went away. Turns out that's not true in, in this disease, in the breast. So with the exact same driving event in the breast, we see a dramatic heterogeneity. Uh, so in fact, when the tumors are small, only about 60% of them are still dependent upon pic 3 ca So if you take doxycycline away, 60% uh, of them, the tumor goes away. But 40%, the tumor keeps right on going, or it initially starts to, to shrink and then takes off again very rapidly. The bigger the tumor gets, the greater fraction that become resistant. And so what are the resistance mechanisms? Jean is working on this. Uh, in fact, she has some really beautiful results. I'm not going to, to spill all of her beans. She can tell that story herself. You've got to invite her over here to talk to you at Mass General. She has really a terrific story. And it's already beginning to suggest to us drug combinations we should be using in this disease. This PI3, so we expect that even for patients that have pic 3 ac mutations, probably only a third of them, based on what we're seeing in the mouse, are actually going to respond to a single agent uh, treatment. Um, so the question is, what combinations should we use? And I think the mouse models from genes work are already suggesting combinations we should be checking in the clinic. Boy, we're really moving along here, aren't we? Can we go, <laughs> can we go back? Uh, uh, OK. So a second model I'll talk about is from Gerberg Wolf at uh, BI Deaconess. Uh, Gerberg is an MD, PhD, uh, and is doing clinical trials uh, in breast cancer, but is also uh, working with mouse models in collaboration with my laboratory. And in particular, we're focusing on BRCA mutant mouse models. Uh, so this is a type of, of triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and, and we know that uh, the pathway is likely to be activated in this disease because P10 is lost very frequently in the disease. As I said earlier, 60% of them have loss of INPP4B, which is another phosphatase that degrades products of PI3 kinase. Uh, and there's evidence for EGF receptor, which drives PI3 kinase, uh, and IGF1 receptor playing some role in this disease. So uh, Gerberg has generated mice uh, that have uh, BRCA gene fluxed uh, in, com in, uh, in a context of P53 het germline. So these mice actually take a year to develop a tumor, a very slowly flow for the tumor to be initiated. But as soon as the tumor appears, within a week, the mouse is dead. So I've never seen a tumor grow so rapidly. So you have to be careful about scheduling vacations. You know, once you, you know, once you, uh, the mouse is born, you've got to make sure that a year later you're going to be in town. Because right on the dot, 
the tumor appears and the mouse is dead in a week. And if you're on vacation, you've blown everything. <laughs> so, so Gerber uh, never gets to take vacations. And, uh, and uh, she can't even go home over the weekends because the mice will die over the weekend. So these... <laughs> she could take the mice with her on vacation, yes. Uh, so these mice have tumors with... Um, Activation of AKT, which you can show by the stain here. The brown stain is an antibody against phospho-AKT. And if you treat them with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, in this case it's BKM120, uh, those tumors, uh, that signal goes away. So uh, it's, you know, virtually every tumor has uh, AKT activation, although there's a mosaic expression. There's some parts of the tumor that have very high phospho-AKT and other parts of the tumor in the same mouse that has no phospho-AKT. So we don't really know what's going on. Are those really separately evolved tumors, or is there some kind of oscillation of this pathway going on and off? It's hard to tell. Uh, but in any event, that all goes away if you add doses of BKM120, which have been effective uh, in treating xenografts in mice. Uh, and so the question is, does that do any good in treating these BRCA tumors? And the answer is yes, it has a dramatic effect. Uh, and so this is what these tumors look like. They're extremely bloody tumors, very uh, uh, complex uh, vasculature, highly vascularized. And within two weeks of treatment with BKM120, all that blood flow goes away. The, the vasculature just collapses, and the center of the tumor becomes totally necrotic. You can still see a little blood vessels at the surface of the tumor, but everything inside is lacking blood vessels and, uh, and becoming incredibly necrotic. And this happens with every single tumor treated. This is reminiscent of work that done by Tina Yuan in my laboratory uh, in collaboration with Jeff Engelman when he was there, in which uh, we looked at the consequence of knocking down the level of PI3 kinase in endothelial cell-specific manner. And if you decrease PI3, if you completely turn off PI3 kinase in the endothelial compartment, mice die at embryonic day 10 and as, uh, 10 to 12. And this happens as a consequence of bleeding into the tissue. So if you don't have PI3 kinase in the endothelial compartment, it still develops normally. The vasculature looks perfectly normal until the heart beats, and as soon as the heart beats, all the blood leaks out and the embryo dies because the endothelial compartment doesn't actually seal tightly enough to keep the blood in. And the same thing is happening if you just reduce PI3 kinase levels in a mouse back to three alleles out of four. You can get a viable mouse, but the neovasculature is impaired in its ability to, to to maintain the blood under pressure. And these neovasculature in particular are quite sensitive. In fact, I'll, I won't go into detail of this, but just point out, this is just showing the blood leaking out in a, uh, in a transplant. Uh, but these heterozygous and syngenaic transplants of B16 F1 melanoma, so in this case, remember that the melanoma itself is not being treated by PI3 kinase, but rather uh, the endothelial compartment of the mouse that is, is the recipient of the transplant where, is where the, the uh, PI3 kinase is impaired. Uh, and you can see this suppresses the ability of those uh, melanomas to grow in the mouse, indicating that PI3 kinase can be thought of as, as an anti-vascularization um, uh, uh, therapy. And in fact, uh, the same thing happens if you add uh, BEZ-235, the PI3 kinase inhibitor, and put uh, VEGF, FGF into a major gel plug, the ability to vascularize that plug is impaired by BEZ-235. So it is an anti-angiogenic uh, therapy. And the question then is, is the effect that we're seeing in these BRCA models just due to anti-angiogenic therapy of PI3 kinase, or is PI3 kinase directly affecting the tumor itself? And uh, to try to answer that, well, the first question is, is, is this actually curing the mice? And the answer is it's not curing the mice. Every single mouse is affected, and every single mouse has a life extension due to going on PI3 kinase inhibitors, both BEZ-235 and BKM-120, although the latter is more effective. We don't know whether that's because it's better to hit only PI3 kinase and not mTOR in this context, or whether it's just that BKM-120 has a better PKPD in getting to the target. This remains to be determined. But it definitely extends the life, but the mice still ultimately die because the tumors grow back, and that vasculature at the periphery of the tumor that still exists ultimately results in the growth of a new tumor. That new tumor now becomes resistant to the same therapy. 
and we're now trying to figure out what the resistance mechanism is. But you can see there's a dramatic extension of the life due to, due to this treatment. And we're now doing combination therapies, uh, including uh, combining PARP inhibitors with PI3K inhibitors as well as MEK inhibitors, uh, and we'll see how that all comes out. But we're quite enthusiastic that this is a great start. Now, keep in mind, that the, what I didn't point out is at the bottom of this is that uh, when you turn on PI3 kinase pathway in particular, that you get a dramatic increase in all the genes involved in glucose uptake and, and, and glycolysis. So keep in mind that uh, insulin regulates glucose metabolism in the liver, muscle, and fat through PI3 kinase AKT signaling. But this is not unique to insulin. In fact, all growth factors that activate PI3 kinase turn up uh, glucose metabolism by expression of glucose transporters and all the enzymes involved in phosphorylating glucose, trapping it, and metabolizing it in particular in moving it into anabolic processes like lipid and protein synthesis. So the expectation is that any tumor that has PI3 kinase activated should be avidly PET positive. And so we've looked at that. And this uh, actually was from Jeff Engelman's paper in the lung, in which he expressed PI3 kinase a tumor develops as a relatively early tumor. Uh, but you can see it's dramatically PET positive. This was actually done in Ralph Weisleiter's lab here at Mass General. Uh, within 48 hours of treatment with PI3 kinase inhibitor, this uh, FDG PET signal goes off. The tumor is still there at 48 hours, but by uh, four days, there's a dramatic shrinkage of the tumor. Here's the tumor, here's the heart. There's the tumor four days later in the same mouse. You can see this dramatic shrinkage. So we've always seen a very strong correlation between turning off the FDG PET within 48 hours and tumor shrinkage. And this is showing up dramatically in all the mouse models we've looked at thus far. And the question is, is this going to be true in the clinic? Um, this is the BRCA model. And so we ask within 48 hours, where the vasculature is still perfectly intact, does the PI3 kinase inhibitor block the glucose uptake? And the answer is, yes, it does. So here's this mouse has multiple tumors. They're all PET positive. And this is 48 hours later. You can see a dramatic decrease in, uh, in glucose uptake into those tumors. So we think there is a direct effect on the tumor, but there's also an effect on the vasculature. And that combination may, in fact, be uh, quite beneficial in treating the tumor. So uh, the question then is, is this going to be predictive in the clinic? And some of our trials are actually designed to address that issue. Jose Baselga already has some very suggestive data coming from the clinic. I don't know if he's going to show that, but um, that's, that's showing that those set of patients that have uh, the greatest response in the clinic are showing a pretty dramatic decrease in FDG PET uh, early on in treatment. So I just want to introduce the people who did this work. I mentioned uh, work that Tina Yuan and Jeff Engelman did in the mouse model uh, of endothelial cell compartment knockouts. And a lot of the background in, in elucidating the pathway came from uh, former postdocs in the lab, Ruben Shaw and Brendan Manning in particular, in collaboration with John Blennis' laboratory and Emil Bardisi, who's here at Mass General. Uh, in collaboration with Ron DePino. And the imaging uh, work was some of this done in, with John Frangioni at uh, BI Deaconess and some with Ralph Weisleiter uh, at, uh, here at Mass General. Uh, the the Stand Up to Cancer team, I, I won't go into detail of all the people involved in the team. It's seven institutions altogether. Uh, the, the leaders of each of the institutions are in black. Uh, in bold, uh, Charles Sawyers at Sloan Kettering, Carlos Artiega at Vanderbilt, Ramon Parsons at uh, Columbia. Gordon Mills at MD Anderson, uh, and at uh, Dana-Farber, Tom Roberts, and of course, Jose Baselga uh, migrating uh, from Barcelona to here at the Mass General. And I'll point out that Eric Weiner is our clinical trials leader. He's the one who's at Dana-Farber. He's been uh, put, getting all the uh, clinical trial people together. We have uh, teleconferences every other week. There's a lot of work going on to clinical trials that, that we're designing for this uh, work. And the people who, uh, whose data I showed are underlined, Gerberg Wolf at Beth Israel, uh, Andrea Myers, I showed a little bit of her work on endometrial, collaboration with Gordon Mills, and Jean Zhao at Dana-Farber. And finally, I want to acknowledge our patient advocates who've played a big role. They attend all of our meetings and uh, in many of our teleconferences and are continually keeping us on track in trying to cure these, this, uh, these diseases. So thank you very much. When, when you target endothelial cells with 
kinase inhibitors, do you think the mechanism of acquired resistance or adaptation is going to be fundamentally different because they're not driven by mutations, but they have all the physiological reserve? How would you, how do you handle resistance there? Yeah, uh, so we need to go back and look at these uh, BRCA tumors that are orig originally extremely bloody, then they, you know, they lose the vasculature, now when they come back, uh, whether the vasculature really has grown back in a VEGF-dependent manner or whether, or PI3 kinase-dependent manner, or whether they bypass this and are using completely different mechanisms. As you know, we're learning that uh, control of vascularization of the tumor is much more complicated than was originally thought. So it's still too early to know that answer, but uh, those are the right questions. Yeah. Jose? So, so this, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a, a, a question that we have discussed in the past, but I'd like to perhaps, if you could mention uh, publicly, is uh, why in preclinical models we don't seem to be seen like a selectivity in terms of efficacy of these compounds uh, for the cell lines that are pi 3 kinase mutant. Uh, for most part, with BZ and with BKM and so on, the level of activity that we see is independent from, from the presence or not of mutations of the pi 3 kinase gene. And wouldn't that be an exception to the rule that when you have uh, driving mutation, you show uh, increased sensitivity? Yeah. So, yeah, so what Jose is pointing out is that, you know, compared to BRAF-driven uh, cancers where you can, you can clearly see that the BRAF inhibitor dramatically affects those cell lines that have BRAF mutations uh, and has very little effect on cell lines that don't have BRAF mutations. You don't see that so clearly, at least in plastic, with the PI3 kinase tumors. And in fact, you know, this, this is a problem that we noticed many years ago when we first started putting overexpressing PI3 kinase in cell lines. Uh, we noticed that what it does is kill cells when you overexpress it or make them go senescent. Uh, and so it's, uh, cells don't actually, in, when growing in plastic, cells are not dependent on PI3 kinase. And you begin to see a differential if you put cells in soft agar or a suspended state, then they become more dependent on the mutant activated PI3 kinase. And what you see is cell death under those conditions whether it's in stasis. If you hit mTOR, the combination drugs like BEZ-235 that hit both PI3 kinase and mTOR tend to be cytostatic on plastic, but if you now go into a non-adherent condition, they become more uh, um, cell-killing. And so uh, I think we have to, again, reevaluate what models we use. That being said, it's clear that secondary mutations very frequently happen in combinations with PIK3CA, such as mutations in RAS, uh, that can clearly make it independent in any scenario of, of PI3 kinase. Joe? The, uh, the one human tumor that uh, is oh, characterized by a tremendous amount of vascularity, remind me of the picture you showed, is choriocarcinoma. Have uh, anyone looked at that tumor? It's pretty rare, of in, course. But, uh, in which carcinoma, sorry? Choriocarcinoma. Choriocarcinoma. No, we've, we've to look at not looked at the, uh, looked at PI3 that. kinase yeah. inhibitor. Yeah, it's another one. It could go into our women's cancer. Yes. Bill and then Bruce. Bill. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on the uh, selectivity. Uh, so at least with respect to our inhibitors, it's BEZ is highly antiproliferative in general in cell culture and BKM as well. But the alpha selective inhibitor shows alpha selectivity in vitro. So I think at least in part the in vitro results for BEZ and BKM are due to you know this broader activity. Uh, but presumably the alpha selective inhibitor will sort of re might reflect more what you would get at least even in part with BEZ or BCAM. Yeah. Bruce? I should add while, while we're waiting for Bruce to get the microphone that uh, there's evidence that came out of Tom Roberts' lab that if you have loss of P10 that, that the uh, PI3 kinase uh, 110 beta is more important target than alpha. And so beta selective inhibitors are going into clinical trials as well as alpha-specific inhibitors, and it may turn out that we'll end up with alpha-specific inhibitors for PIK3CA mutations and beta-specific inhibitors for P10 loss, which may give you a better efficacy toxicity ratio. But, you know, all these things need to be tested in the clinic. Uh, so both you and Bill, Lou, have pointed out that there, there could be secondary mutations, and this really clouds the, the picture in terms of interpreting <coughs> single-agent trials. You could conclude from a, a trial of a PI3 kinase inhibitor 
it's of no value and that the, you know it, we should throw it away. But in fact, it may be that it's necessary to inhibit multiple pathways to see a, a response. I think the HER2 experience is a pretty good uh, mm -hmm. indication of that, that with cytotoxics. But um, in, in targeted therapies, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that the PI3 kinase inhibitors are essential as part of the, uh, uh, an effective regimen, but we won't see that efficacy by using it as a single agent because there's another driver that can take over for it. So it, the trials that you're doing are really a, a challenge, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why we put this team together. We realize this is not going to be as simple as Gleevec and BCR able. Uh, and uh, yeah, the mouse models already tell us that single agents are not always going to work, even though that you have a pic 3 ca driven tumor. But what's already emerged from our models, and I don't really have time or I shouldn't anyway reveal all of Gene Zal's work uh, and all of Gerberg's work and that's yet to be published and still in process. But it's, the models are, being, are really suggesting mechanisms of resistance. And when we go back and look at the human uh, disease, we are seeing the events happening in the human disease that we're seeing happen in the mouse. And so I think we can anticipate which combinations to use based on, on, on the mutational events. And that's the way the trials will be done. And they'll have to be, you know, they'll be very small trials, maybe 50, 60, 100 patient trials where you clearly can define exactly the subset of events that w are the anticipated resistance mechanism, do those combinations in the well-defined population. Uh, if you can find enough patients, and having seven institutions together, we can find enough patients to do these. And that's the way those combinations will get approved. If you did them randomly without look interrogating, you'll never get figure this out. 